further ado, I think this is what I would like to highlight. I'm very pleased to have Dr. Steve with us. Myself, I've been looking forward to hear his speech. Um, uh, I was actually uh, following a lot and um, Save for Government is one of the top growing uh, factor in my opinion. And I think Dr. Steve and Rob can talk about this more and more. There's a lot of potential there. So without further ado or delay, please, Dr. Steve, if you um, would take up the floor, will be my pleasure. All right, uh, let's do a, a, a switch off here so I can share my screen. Yeah, done. And so while I'm while I'm pulling that up, let me just. Let me just do a, a quick introduction and background. Uh, we also have Rob Patrick uh, from our organization as well. So I would, I would like to give him a chance to introduce himself. So just for the group that I have not met or come across yet, uh, my name is Dr. Steve Maynard. Uh, I am a SAFE fellow. I'm a member of the framework team within Scaled Agile. Uh, and that's the team that that develops the fr all of the framework, uh, so all the articles that you read on the framework, as well as the courseware. So the, the IP that's in the courseware, the courses usually generate out of our team and go to market, and then they're, they're maintained and, and updated by, uh, by other teams w with, our, with our participation, of course. But we really kind of create that, that initial vision for for new courses and new products in the marketplace to meet the demands of what, what people are asking for. Safe for government is one such instance. Uh, and uh, I, I came to Scaled Agile in 2016, so uh, four and a half years ago. And I came to Scaled Agile from about 15 years prior working in in the, in the US federal government space with federal systems integrator uh, companies. Uh, big companies like SAIC and Unisys and, and companies like that and small boutique companies, but all working in federal contracting in the IT, in the IT market. And it was in, in that market, while I was in that market, uh, I, I came across SAFE it, uh, as an agilist that saw it was, uh, you know, very relevant to the government environment. Uh, I had the opportunity to uh, be lead the, the charge within the company that I was working for to become the first safe gold partner in the federal space and uh, to also uh, use safe as the primary technical approach for uh, our bid for a government contract and was selected. And so basically created the first official uh, safe win inside the, the federal market for, for a contracting company and the first implementation of safe in the federal government. So it's with that background of, of experience and, and seeing this conversation about agile adoption in government agencies evolve over many, many years that when I came to Scaled Agile uh, and we saw that interest continue to grow, we're getting pinged a lot from, you know, hey, we, we're in this government agency, we really want to make this work. And we just felt that there was uh, a, a big need for uh, doing something very focused in this market. And, and that's what we've been doing. And I'll share a little bit of that in the presentation tonight. So that's me. Rob, you want to do it? I know, so I'll, when I pull this, the deck up, I'll have, also have a picture of, of, of Stosh, who is our federal practice uh, lead within the company. He's not with us tonight, but I've got his contact information here on the first slide. So while I'm pulling that up, Rob, do you want to uh, uh, introduce yourself? Sure, I can go next. Uh, this is Rob Patrick. It's interesting, I actually recognize a few names that are up here on the Zoom. Uh, <laughs> window people I've talked to in the past. So I'm part of a team at Scaled Agile that supports um, our, our entities or agencies or customers that, that need to 
are, are themselves transforming and need to have a direct relationship with Scaled Agile in order to buy the licensing and do things like get, you know, get, get our own consulting people in there on occasion to, to talk to them and things like that. So uh, it's great to be here with you all. Uh, I'm, I actually am in the East Coast in the Virginia area in DC, but I work all the way up from uh, from the Eastern time zone of Canada to the Eastern time zone in the Caribbean. But, but, if there's anything we have to do for you, feel free to reach out. Thanks. So, uh, Mark, maybe maybe if you don't mind, uh, you could just uh, put your contact information Make in the chat. Cool, that's fine. If, if that would be okay. Certainly, for sure. Great. And uh, Mark, also, uh, so I, I really want this to be uh, at least uh, the ability for for our, you know, questions not just at the end, but if there's something that uh, is more more timely as we as we go through the deck, I'm certainly open to that. I don't think this is formal at all, and so you know you could you can either uh, put a question in chat and Mark, if you don't mind monitoring that, and if it's something we need to answer as we go, just jump in and say, hey, we've got a question. Uh, sure. And and you know I'm I'm happy to, to take uh, those uh, both during during the presentation as well as at the end. Okay. Sure. So uh, everyone's welcome. Any question is welcome. But please, if you're not speaking, I prefer to go on mute. Uh, if you have question, put it in the chat. Uh, and I think Dr. Steve will have a poses in order to check everyone's question from once in a while. But for now, I would appreciate if everyone except Dr. Steve or anyone speaking go on mute. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm going to expose just a, a little transparency here about, uh, about where I am generationally. I have not mastered the ability to present uh, and monitor a chat channel at the same time. So uh, Mark, if you don't mind just kind of watching that for me. I, my my kids would crush it. I mean, they could do that without even thinking. Uh, I I'm I'm not a digital native, so uh, it, it's just something I have to work around. Hopefully, you guys can understand that and and be patient with, with me on that. We hate right. multitasking, so we are promoting uh, the opposite. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. All right. So uh, the the discussion tonight. Uh, and what we I talked with Mark and just kind of getting a sense of who this audience is and the things that that you might be interested in uh, is is in the in the basically the answer came back is let's just talk about how this uh, how this is evolving the the adoption of agile and safe and specifically in the government market and so that's what we're going to talk about uh, so some of this you may have heard before. I don't know who in the audience may have uh, attended uh, a Safer Government class or one of the talks or workshops or webinars that I've done in the past. If so, you may see something that you've seen before uh, or there, or maybe not. And not knowing who the audience was, I, I felt we need to cover some basic things. I do have some things that are also new that I've not presented anywhere. So you'll get to be the first to, to see and hear some things and I'm very excited to do that as well. So let's let us dive in. So I'd just like to set a, a baseline for our conversation. We all know that Agile's been a, a topic around for a long time, not just back to 2001 in the Agile Manifesto, but even before we you know well before then my personal agile journey began in the mid 1990s when as a project manager i attended conference like most people do and and saw a presentation from somebody who had written a book called extreme project management and for any software developers on this webinar you, you understand the reference there, and, and this was the time when extreme programming, XP, was really a hot topic, and this author had written a book basically saying, uh, uh, what if you're a project manager and the, 
the project teams in your environment are starting to do this strange thing called extreme programming. So we're going to talk about extreme project management. Anyway, that's that's when my my journey began, and and it's just been a continuing you know uh, uh, escalation and, and involvement uh, up through to today. We're seeing the same thing in companies and in markets. They they begin with an, an initial exploration of, of agile and, 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 and then it grows. Government agencies, not surprising from my experience anyway, and from many conversations that I've had with people who work in or with government agencies, is they're, they're a little bit behind all of those learning curves. Now that may not, that may not remain true, and I'll talk a little bit about that, um, but at least what we have seen is that, is that has been the historical pattern. So to understand why governments ha have and continue to look at, at changing their product development model primarily, and we'll, and we'll get to some more mission agility things later, but the, the, the primary reason that, that I have heard and that went into the original creation of this slide now almost three years ago that and this is a this is a synthesis of many conversations as well as my own experience that there's catalysts there's catalysts in the government agency in the mission in, in the in the nature of the services they're providing in the customers that they're that they're serving that are causing the leaders inside of government agencies to to step back and think about how how we are serving our, our customer, our citizens, how we're providing those, those services, those capabilities, because what they're finding more and more increasingly that the way they've always done things in the past is no longer sufficient. And it's for lots of different reasons. I won't go through each of these on the slide, but every time I presented this, there's always resonating with most, if not all of these things. Whether it's, whether it's rapid changes in the threat environment, if you're in a, if you're in a defense or intel space, uh, we all know the, the cybersecurity threat, but it could also just be you know, non-state actors, right? Uh, asymmetric warfare creates all kinds of, of new challenges uh, that, that the old pace of great capability uh, to bear is no longer sufficient, all right? Uh, digital transformation, connect that uh, you know, with the idea of new technologies coming on board. And then once you quantify everything, it's like... Sorry, hey, hey everybody, if, if you don't mind, just make sure you're on mute because we're getting somebody's other phone conversation. I'd appreciate that. Uh, new technologies, uh, AI, blockchain, uh, 3D, 5G, Autonomous vehicles, the, the list goes on and on. How those play in, in how government agencies are, are using technology to, to accomplish their mission. And those, those technologies are changing rapidly. Those same agencies, if you look in the lower right-hand corner, also have the problem of a lot of their technology dollars are going into old, antiquated, duplicative systems with lots of technical debt, uh, that are very expensive to maintain, but they're also very expensive to replace. So uh, all of these kinds of things go into this big pot and you stir it all together and say, look, the world that we live in today, the, the process models that we had for, for technology development in the past are simply proving insufficient. We need we need, and the, the build's not there, sorry. We need mission agility, all right? That's what they're, what, the, what they're asking for. We need to get new capabilities to deliver services to citizens and warfighters exponentially faster uh, than we have before. And we, mean, we need to be able to pivot as we get new learnings and, and new threats and new things faster than we've ever been able to do before. So governments increasingly, depending on technology, and think about the government services that you get today, whether it's paying your taxes, whether it's, um, uh, whether it's the, the election process. I mean, pick any government, you know, any government agency, any government service. 
and and they are all deeply deeply dependent on technology to execute the mission of that agency but the challenge is that the that the old development methods and this group is since you're at this webinar you you're, you're probably very much resonating with this is is those 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 legacy practices are are relating to and, and equating to the kinds of problems you're seeing on the right hand side of the screen right? contracts uh, are are not designed for this new way of working and so that delays uh, we've we've got we've got SDLC models that are are phase gate and not designed for flow uh, organizational stovepipes where it, where the, the idea of a value stream is crossing monolithic organizational org charts and sometimes those different parts of the organization don't play well with each other and that injects delays we've got all these all these kinds of issues and to to use the paraphrase from from einstein we cannot solve our problems with the same thinking we used when we created them and so we've got to think differently we, we can't we can't use yesterday's patterns to solve tomorrow's problems just is not is not proving to, to work we all know that agile has really become pretty much the de facto standard i don't see too many people fighting tooth and nail to to save waterfall these days uh, the the state of agile report which has been around now it's just coming out the 14th annual report this is from the 13th report uh, when you look at the uh, agile adoption rates uh, it's 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 it, like I said, it's becoming almost the de facto standard for all the reasons that you see in the middle of the screen there. People need to accelerate delivery. They need to be able to change priorities on a dime. Uh, that quality has to stay high, uh, all those different things. Who's responsible for the keeping equipment for the inspectors? Hey, hey, Mark, I don't know. Can you tell from your side where, where the, uh, the unmuted phone is? You could find that and maybe send them a note. That would be great. So on top of that, we've got we've got DevOps emerging, right, right on the heel of as if Agile wasn't disruptive enough. Now organizations are dealing with the, the challenge of DevOps. Even more uh, a hotter topic is DevSecOps, and I'll come back to that at the end of this talk. So we get it, Steve. We, we, our government agencies need to go agile, but what about scaling agile? Right, that, that's like a, a, a sub, subset uh, topic. Uh, the, the, the challenge is that, that agencies are dealing with an incre increasingly complex world, right? The kinds of missions that government agencies have to deliver we're not talking about small websites uh, and, and startup companies. We're talking about, about massive missions serving millions upon millions upon millions of citizens, providing services that are pretty darn important. We're talking about, about defense. We're talking about healthcare. We're, we're talking about you know, other social programs. The, the kinds of systems that it takes to deal with entire populations with these levels of complexities and you know all the laws that 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 have to be taken into account as business rules inside of these systems uh they're 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 massive right this is not just your you know your two pizza team that's going to go build these things the agile practices have have certainly proven their worth but we need to keep in mind that Agile was developed for small co-located teams. Agile by itself wasn't designed for the challenges that many government agencies face. And that's, I think, partly the reason why government agencies generally, globally, were slower to adopt Agile as a developed model compared to their commercial counterparts. Because the Agile methods like Scrum and Kanban and so forth by themselves don't address things like strategy and budgets and governance and, and compliance and all those things that are so common in the government uh, IT space. So what's the, what's the solution? So this is the reason why even before I joined the company in, in the very 
first time I encountered SAFE, it was version 2.5. So even from that very early version, which was nowhere as far advanced as 5.0, I, I could see that at least here was one thought leadership group who was trying to address those kinds of challenges that I was having to live through as a program manager over very, very large government programs, like hundreds of millions of dollars size programs. And, and we will talk through some of the things that, that specifically address some of those government challenges as we go through the rest of the talk tonight. But while the big picture is up, I'll also wanna make sure everybody is aware of the fact that as of, it was four or five, or four, six, I, I forget. We have actually made government a first class citizen right on this big picture. If you look in the upper left hand corner, historically that was just enterprise. It was representing the, the overall organization and had a very commercial only slant to it. And, and as I came into the company and I talked to Dean and I said, look, you know, government needs to see themselves represented here so that they know they have a place in the framework. And they've also have some unique challenges. And we can definitely write guidance that is in fact unique for government. So uh, at the end of this talk, I will show you what's behind that government icon for those who may not have explored that yet. And how we're, and the kinds of things that we're doing as a company to very specifically support uh, our partners, our government customers, anybody that's working in that government space, uh, what that support is and, and how we can help you if, if you're working in or with a government agency. One of the things that, I've, that, that seems to really help in having that conversation with government agencies is helping them understand that, that SAFE is not a is not a, a fly-by-night conversation. In fact, it is, it is the unquestionable market leader with, with over 600,000 people trained in 110 countries, 350 partners, many of those partners represented on this call tonight, uh, many, many great case studies on successful safe adoption in government spaces. There's, there's just not the, the depth and, and the, the proof of this being successful uh, in any other al alternative method or approach, bar none. You see that in, in, the, in the State of Agile survey I showed you, you see it in the Gartner and Analyst reports. So there's, there's, and why that's important is of all the markets that I've worked in, government leaders tend to be the most risk averse for the most part with some exceptions. Uh, and, and they certainly don't want to go out on a limb and propose adopting something like SAFE if there is not real proof that it's tried, it's tested, it's matured, it's worked. Uh, many others have adopted it. They're not the first ones doing it. And, and we have that. We have all of those proof points there. And so that increases their confidence that, that they're not putting them and their agency and their mission at risk uh, by going SAFE. And you see that in the agencies that have, have made significant uh, transitions and adoptions of, of SAFE in the US government, as well as the global market. I haven't updated this recently. It's certainly not all of the agencies by far. There are many others. Uh, I, I just haven't gotten that updated information and updated this slide. But we do have actual case studies in the government space. We have videos of government presenting technical talks and even main stage talks at our summits. So the, the, the proof, the evidence of people who've already done it in their government agencies is without a question out there and there's some great success stories. As illustrated by some of these quotes that we pulled uh, from, from people who voluntarily uh, said they would go on record uh, and we could quote them by name, by agency, uh, about what they have seen, the success that they have uh, experienced by adopting the Scaled Agile framework in their government program. And those, those continue to come in uh, every single day. We see them, and we even see them in the press now, where there'll be stories published, 
either in, in a government publication or something like CIO uh, that just happens to be a, a government a, a person interview. So that's just a, a quick flyby of sort of why Agile is a hot topic and, and why SAFE has is, is really uh, been the, the model of choice for scaling Agile in government agencies. So I'd like to transition to talk about kind of where we are. Now I can only talk about this from the perspective of the US government because I don't know uh, the unique nature of how Agile is being adopted in the Canadian government or the Mexican government or the German government or the Indian government. I, I've, I've had snippets, but I don't live there day in and day out. And so I can only share the patterns that I know. I know that the US can tend to be very influential in some countries. And so this may still yet be useful. Or it could simply uh, show you patterns that you might look to your own governments if you're from outside the US and see similar patterns and similar things happening in your space as well. So with that as a backdrop, let's just kind of get into it a little bit. So one of the interesting things, I shared a little bit about my history and I, I first started working in the government space in the government market in, in 2003. And so that's now, you know, 17 years in one form or another. And had, and it, as I shared, have been involved in, in embracing Agile even before that. And what's interesting is you, sometimes you have to take a step back and get a little perspective. And what this, what this chart shows, it, it's kind of a timeline, but what it shows is from my experience and from many others that are in the Agile community and, and here in the DC area, we have seen this, this crescendo, this acceleration. And in, at first it was maybe once every couple of years. I used to have another version of this chart where I had a 2008 milestone, but I had to drop it off because you know, we, we had new things to add. It was like every couple of years, maybe something would happen that gave us a little glimmer of hope that maybe the government was actually going to be open to having this conversation about Agile. I can promise you back in 2008, they weren't open at all. As I was, as I was you know, and I and many others were trying to champion to our government customers, hey, this is, you know, this is a better way of, of working. You may want to look at it. No interest. Just, it was just really hard to get them to be open to that conversation. Some of you may be still experiencing that with your government customers or in your agency. And then we started seeing little things, you know, little breakthroughs, whether it was the, you know, the, the, the our first federal CIO had this 25 point plan. And even though he didn't say the word agile, it was clear that was the message. The 2012 GAO report was, was really sent shockwaves out. It was like the first official hey, Agile's a thing, we need to be paying attention here. And we've just seen that go, and, and so instead of every other year, it's every year, and then multiple times a year, new things happen, another shoe drops. Um, and, and, and they are all indicating and showing that, hey, government is warming up, this is becoming a thing. Uh, at, at first it was, okay, we'll talk about Agile, and then it was, we'll allow Agile, and now what we're seeing is, no, it's Agile is what we have to do in government. It, there really isn't an option. And just to have witnessed that entire transition uh, over the course of the last 12 years or so has really been in, informative. So it, it's just good to have that perspective, even though we may not be where we would like to be with our government agencies, at least in the US, I can tell you we've come a long way. And I'm super excited about the future because we're, we're seeing things that, honestly, I would never in a million years have guessed in my lifetime I would have seen in, in the government space. And I'm seeing it today. And, and it's, it's absolutely exciting. And I'll share a couple of those examples with you. And hopefully you're seeing some of the same things in your government as well. So here's some examples. First, we are seeing agencies in the, in the US government actually change their life cycle model regulations to say, no, uh, we're not doing waterfall anymore. We're, we're, we're full on agile. 
And in fact, one of the first ones to do that under the leadership of Mark Schwartz, who was the CIO at, at uh, US Customs and, and, and Immigra or, or Citizen Immigration Services, uh, led the charge in that agency to rewrite their, their life cycle regulations. And you see the, the snapshot of the cover here that says Agile is now our default way of working. If you want to use, if you have a program that wants to use Waterfall and DHS today, you actually have to apply for a waiver and get permission to use Waterfall because Agile is the default, of some, uh, default assumed lifecycle model that every program is, is adopting. And we're seeing other agencies start to follow suit and do the very same thing. The FAA in the United States is another example and others like uh, GSA and others are, are falling right in line with that. Here's another uh, telltale sign. In the United States, the, we have the Government Accounting Office, the GAO. It, it, they're, they're the bean counters. They're, they're the, the, the finance folks. They're the auditors that audit programs to make sure they're fiscally sound and using government taxpayer and taxpayer dollars appropriately. And their auditors have audit guides. An auditor goes out to a federal program, audits them, and they're following a guide that says, as an auditor, these are the questions you should ask, these are the things that you should look for to determine if this program is healthy, if the money is being used as it's supposed to be used, and it's delivering what it's supposed to deliver. Well, the problem was, as Agile started to emerge, auditors would go out to federal programs using Agile, and they'd say, wait a minute, you guys are speaking a language we don't even understand. You're, you're doing crazy things like story points and, and, and iterations and PIs, and we don't even know what those are. We don't even know how to audit you. And they finally recognized, look, we have to give our auditors a completely different playbook so that when they go out to a program that's using Agile, they actually understand what that is, and they know how to actually do an audit. And so to, they said, we're going to have to create a new guide. And what they did is they, they created an expert panel of government and industry experts. Both Stosh and I were honored to be part of that expert panel. Uh, so I was there from the very first meeting four years ago to launch this effort. Uh, and, and I would give them credit to say they really did listen. And so when this, when this document comes out, and I suspect that, that you know, people will, inside any, maybe and outside the U.S. would be able to eventually access it, is what you will see is, is they really did, over, over this four-year conversation, actually get why Agile is different. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a state of being and thinking. It's not just, you know, it's not just a change around the edges. And so now... And this is going to be released actually next month here in the U.S. And going forward, you're going to see federal programs that are following Agile actually being audited. Are you truly Agile? How exciting is that? Because I, the, one of the other things we've seen for those of us that have been in the U.S. federal market is audit guides uh, tend to be treated by federal ag agencies as the answers to the test. So if we know we're going to get audited this way, then we're, we're going to align our practices to what the audit guide says. That way we know we get a good grade. So the influence of this document, we know is going to be tremendous. Uh, so that's a pattern we're seeing. Maybe you're seeing something like that in, in your government as well. The acquisition community, we all know how incredibly painful contracting is in, in this whole conversation of agile adoption when you're, when you're dealing with government agencies. It's just, it's just absolutely mind boggling. I came into the government uh, market after uh, about an equivalent time working in the commercial space in banking and, and insurance and healthcare. And I just was mind boggling how the contracting process works in the government market when I first entered that market. And certainly as it applies to agile with, with the need to go fast, small, quick, small batch, ability to pivot as we learn, all these different things. The contracting environment was so completely not ready for that and not aligned to that. And we're seeing that change as well. We're seeing the agencies that are responsible for acquisitions 
both across the entire government as well as within each agency, really starting to do massive reforms to the, the entire acquisition lifecycle model and create new, new vehicles and new, new abilities for, for ways of contracting that are designed specifically to support an agile way of working, which is really exciting. We're also seeing some incredibly innovative things happening. If you're not familiar with Kessel Run, which is an Air Force program here in the United States, I would highly recommend that you go Google that. It's not the Kessel Run from Star Wars. That's what inspired it, as the logo might suggest. But this is actually an, an incredibly innovative software program up in Boston that's actually run at almost like a, a tech startup. Even the military members, the Air Force military members that are part of that program come into a building not wearing their military uniform, but wearing civilian clothing, like just like the, the civilian contractors they're working with. It's a very different, very agile, very Silicon Valley looking environment that, that they have infused into the Air Force. And, and it is just breaking barriers and doing things that honestly in my lifetime I never believed that I would see in a government agency much less a DOD Department of Defense agency but yet we're seeing it today they are they are using the most advanced uh, you know cloud-based uh, you know containerization Kubernetes you name it uh, again, it's it's just like it came right out of out of uh, you know out of the valley on the west coast. Very agile, uh, very modern, and just unbelievable. And a lot of people in the government space are watching how this program is going, and we're seeing their patterns start to be adopted in other places all over government. And so this could be a one again one of those acceleration points on that timeline curve where when we look back beyond that point we just we just saw a, a, you know a much much faster transformation going on in government agencies than when we had seen in the times past so i, I could talk a lot about other, about a lot of other things that that i'm seeing is there a question or somebody just unmute? Mark, do we have a question? Maybe someone just needs to mute. Just a reminder, if, if, if everybody can hear me, especially the person that's talking about this now, if you can mute, it would be awesome. So, all these, great, all these great things are happening, which means that, okay, uh, government is agile now, right? The sun is shining, the birds are chirping, uh, you know, everything's just, you know, all, uh, you know, all sunshine and roses. Well, if you're on this call uh, and came to this webinar, you know as well as I do that that's not exactly the case. You've got a lot of good things going on, but we still have a lot of work to do. We still have four implementations of, of Agile and DevOps that are still making agencies skeptical uh, about whether or not this will work in their particular mission. We still have, even though some governance and lifecycle policies have changed, but there's a lot to happen. And they're still mandating very waterfall ways of working. Contracting is changing, but it's not fully there yet. We still have individual contracting officers. We just don't have the, the depth of experience with agile contracting. Sorry, Dr. Steve. Yes. We have a question. Yes. Um, so uh, when GAO audit evaluate the agility, what are the metrics they use? Well, that, that, is a, that is a great question. And I was in a lot of those meetings and they were some very heated meetings. Uh, I think we did a good job of, of making it clear that, that the, the anti-pattern metrics that you may have seen in, you know, in the early days of Agile, like trying to take story points and things like that as, as performance metrics, I think we were pretty successful 
in squelching those kinds of metrics, the, the, the kinds of, of metrics that wound up in that guidance, I would say are, are very closely aligned to the, the metrics that you would find promoted through resources like uh, the, the DevOps Handbook from Gene Kim and Accelerate from Dr. Nicole Forsgren, who was part of Gene's organization before they went to, uh, into the Google ecosystem. So you're looking about you know, how frequently released, the, the mean time to recovery, you know, those, those real actual no kidding metrics that, that, that uh, show how fast things are flowing through the system through the, the delivery pipeline and where the bottlenecks are, as well as how stable those things, the telemetry inside the applications that, that give us a sense of, of how healthy the applications are. All of those metrics, I would, I would point you to those, those two references. Again, the DevOps Handbook and, and Accelerate by, uh, by Nicole Forsgren. If you have not read those, Go read those because those metrics are the ones that that many people in that group uh, really kept bringing up. And I haven't seen the final draft, but the last meeting I was in, I think that's the kind of stuff that you're going to find, not the the real anti-pattern kinds of agile metrics that I think a lot of us have suffered from. All right, Jason, did, does that answer your question? Hopefully, it does. Yes. Okay, great. Uh, what else are we seeing? That, that whole project mindset is still very deeply ingrained in the government context. The Project Management Institute, PMI, which I love PMI. I've been a PMP since uh, 1999, and, and I'm still an active uh, member. My cert's active. So I get it. I was, I was raised in that, in that mindset. But as we teach in SAFE, the, the flow-based process model doesn't really peacefully coexist very well with the, the project model. As you've seen in, in say 5.0, we've, we've really aligned to what Mick Kirsten, another great thought leader who, who keynoted our summit last year uh, in his book, Project to Product, talks about uh, is that, that project metaphor is just not helpful when you're trying to think flow and flow is the key to getting fast time to market. And, but that project orientation is very deeply ingrained in our government agencies. So we still have a lot of work to do to, to help government agencies understand how to plan, provide oversight, provide funding when you're trying to work in flow, not in projects. We still have long acquisition cycles that create lots of delays in value delivery, and that's a real challenge. And then just lack of common frameworks. I've worked in, with agencies here in the US where they've just kind of allowed any kind of model that you want to use in this team and that team and this program and that program. And so you just end up with this mishmash of, of process models and, and, and different, different language. Uh, and, and it just creates a tower of Babel inside the agency. They don't have a common language, a common lexicon, a common taxonomy, a common process model. And that creates real issues. So here are the trends that I'm seeing and that I would suggest you look for that I think are gonna be the hallmark of where Agile goes in our government space going forward. So here's what we're seeing. We're seeing lean Agile, safe, even DevOps adoption in non-software areas, hardware, mission operations, things like satellites and, and aircraft carriers and jet airplanes and you know, things with lots of physical, cyber-physical components are also adopting these very same practices. If you look at the large solution level in SAFE, uh, enterprise solution delivery, that is where a lot of, of that kind of program resonates. Uh, Scaled Agile was also part of creating what's growing in the market as industrial DevOps. How does DevOps work when you're dealing with a physical system? Because it has to work differently, right? It's not, it's not all ones and zeros inside of a cloud. Uh, you, you're bending metal. So how do I do DevOps when I do that? Well, well, there's some patterns, and we've been part of the group pioneering those patterns. 
uh, and and we'll we'll be more overt about that going forward. But you're going to see that trend. The, those were the areas, the programs that were that for a long time said agile does not apply to us. DevOps certainly does not apply to us, and now they're starting to change that. DevSecOps, huge. I'll talk a little bit uh, in, in a minute about uh, some, some events that happened recently that around DevSecOps that, that we had to respond to as a company. You may be familiar with that, and I'll give you an update on that. Uh, but DevSecOps, as, as a next evolution, even beyond DevOps, is a big hot topic, and so I would keep your radar on for that. Uh, because it's 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 gaining momentum and it's gaining momentum fast. Business agility is huge in the commercial space, and now we're seeing that same conversation uh, copied or or emulated in government agencies. Usually referred more to as mission agility versus business agility, but it's the same kind of concept. It's it's taking the concepts and principles of lean and agile that were very uh, common in the technology part of their organization. And now it's being adopted outside of the technology organization, just like we're seeing in the commercial space. So if you look at SAFE, if you look at our core, at our competencies, we have the organizational agility competency. We are seeing the things that we write about in that article appearing in the government agencies, also outside of their technology operation. Uh, major changes to acquisition and governance, regulations and statutes. We're, we're just seeing every single year here in the US, there are new laws, there are new things in the, in like in the Defense Authorization Acts that have to be passed every year, that Congress, our legislature is mandating uh, changes to the acquisition model that are creating all kinds of new abilities for government to acquire software, hardware, services, in, in ways that are much, much faster and much, much more aligned to those, those rapid cycle times that, that we teach in Lean, Agile, and Safe. Growth of these innovation labs like Kessel Run, they're starting to pop up all over the place. Everybody's getting permission to create their own little experiment, their own lab. Hey, just give us the, uh, you know, the permission to sort of step outside the box and do things in a very different way that looks more like the, the Facebooks, Googles, Apples, uh, Netflixes of the world, and we think we can serve citizens better, and more and more are getting permission to do that. So you're gonna see those the labs pop up all over the place. Uh, auditing guidance, to the extent that, that other governments follow US's lead, or maybe have done this already, and are auditing based on of Agile, uh, that's real Agile and not just you know, a misinterpretation of Agile, that's going to have that effect of, hey, that's the answers to the test. So if that's how we're going to be audited, then, then we need to do what the audit guide says. That's going to be a massive accelerant the more that's done. And then finally, we're seeing a pattern where more and more RFPs, requests for proposals from government agencies, are actually requiring the use of SAFE. They're, they're, they're not hiding it. They're not obscuring it. They're just saying, look, we follow a SAFE model. We expect in your, in your uh, labor plan to propose people who are certified in Scaled Agile. And you know, if they're not, don't, don't bother bidding because we're a safe shop and we're really not interested in, in hiring anybody that, that doesn't understand that model. So that's, a, that's a, a real trend. Mark, do we have any other questions on that before I shift gears to talking about the memo? I think yet any question, please uh, feel free to unmute yourself and speak or put it in the chat. Um, right, I've actually have one from Mark. Yeah. Uh, so Mark, do you want to uh, speak about it? Okay. Can, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, yeah, hi, I Steve. can hear you. Okay. Hi, Steve. Hey. Uh, I, I can think of like various use cases for safe in government. On mm -hmm. one hand, you might have government agencies developing products in house. Yes. Another one is you might have government agencies with suppliers developing products for them. That's correct. And, and we then have you, might, you might have government agencies collaborating on product development with the suppliers. That's all correct. Yes. So, so the question is, and, and the people out there might be asking themselves the question, would SAFE be beneficial to the government agencies in all of those cases? Not only are they beneficial, we have case studies in all of those. So yes. we, have, we have the massive system integrators. So think companies like Lockheed Martin, Northrop Grumman, Raytheon, 
you, you know, the um, uh, general dynamics who have a, a kind of a different thing in terms of, of what that kind of acquisition looks like. Uh, in, in those cases, if the government agency is contracting to buy a jet fighter, uh, most of that process model really exists inside of the, of the contractor, not so much the government, right? Because right. it's a massive effort, right? We're talking tens of thousands of people, right? There's probably more people working on that program that may, than, than the, that agency may have in their entire agency, right? So in that case, this is really about the contractor adopting SAFE as a way to better deliver. And we absolutely have that case study. It's major weapon system programs that, that have, where the, you know, those large companies adopted SAFE. We likewise have the case where the government agency has adopted SAFE as their model. And, and as they engage with contractors as their suppliers, they're, they're either, if those suppliers are, are supplying labor to integrate into and with the government team, that's where they're actually requiring, we expect you to supply us with people who are SAFE certified because they're gonna integrate with our people and this is the way we work and it's really not optional. In other cases, that supplier may not be labor integrated with, but the agency is very concerned that they have gone through their agile transformation. They now understand the conversation around the suppliers and that supply chain and that if their, that supplier's process model is not designed for the speed and the ability to pivot and the things that Agile brings, then that's going to create a problem, right? Because they may not be able to respond to, to how they're working and, and, and supply whatever it is that they're supplying. And so we, we have that as well. And in that case, the guidance we have, if you look to the, to the big picture in, in large solution where we have the supplier on the solution train, and we talk about how to deal with suppliers, uh, when they're not integrated into the art, uh, how do you deal with that? And the guidance that's in that article is exactly what I have used in those situations. And it actually turns out pretty well. It's all really about just facilitating expectations. What I have recommended to government uh, leaders who are responsible for these programs is set those expectations up front. Put it in the RFI, put it in the RFP, make it very clear contract language that that even if you're an, an external supplier and you're not, you know, we're not telling you that you have to use SAFE, but we're making it very clear that you're part of our program. This is the process we use. We have, we have program increments. We demo working things at the end of those. You are going to be expected to participate in some events. You may go back and use Waterfall, but you better be able to understand the dependencies on that you have and that are on you and and when you're expected to deliver and you know it's going to be in this metaphor not in your project metaphor yeah. so do what you want but we're the agency and this is how we run and this is what we expect of you the more they can set those expectations clearly in the contract the less painful it's going to be when you get to execution okay thanks Does that make sense yeah, that's good. Thanks. Another question, I think, from Gary. Yeah, Gary. Gary, do you want to? Yeah, yeah. I was going to ask. So you talked about the uh, program audits from the from the government. Are yeah. there any uh, questions or points in those to address kind of that cultural shift toward agile value and culture over necessarily those metrics and just hit these targets? Yes, absolutely. So again, I can only speak to the, the US audit guide that has been created by GAO. And, and every chance I get, I speak so highly of those, fact, of those folks. In fact, last year at our summit, uh, GAO actually submitted and presented a tech talk in the government track on, on this new audit process. So they presented at our conference. I was just so excited about that. Uh, they really have listened. And so, yes, you will absolutely, in the front part of, the, of this audit guide, there is a, 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 you know, an extensive conversation about the, the, the cultural implications, not just in the general case, but specifically in the government case. 
around as a as a U.S. government agency or program, you know, that understand that there are cultural ramifications of of adopting an, an, an agile way. Uh, as proactively as the the technical process your your you know your your engineers are following so they didn't prescribe now you know remember audit audit guides don't prescribe they they communicate patterns and say these are the things we've seen that are the industry best practices uh, we know that because we had a very uh, a diverse panel of people and and readings and resources that inform us what those best practices are and so these are the things we're going to be looking for when we come out and look at your agile program and and so for example if we see that you are just doing agile you're mimicking the language of agile but you've never transformed and then you're wondering why you're you're getting bad metrics and results well our auditors are going to call you out on it right because you really haven't changed your culture you just changed labels and kept doing what you were comfortable with. So I really applaud them for the courage that they had to, to actually put that kind of stuff in the guide. Hope that answered the question. Absolutely, thank you. You bet. Any more questions? Cool. Well, let, I'm just about to ready to wrap up, and then we'll we'll just have all kinds of general questions. But let me let me address uh, what we just refer to as the memo. So uh, back in uh, about December, late it was late last year, November December timeframe. The the Air Force hired a, a new chief software officer, and one of the first things that he did. And coming on board, going around and looking at some of the programs in the Air Force, is he wrote this memo. And in this memo, he one of the things, and it was it was point number eight of nine points, and it simply stated, as you see in the orange lettering, that programs are highly discouraged from using rigid prescriptive frameworks such as a scaled agile framework. Now, of course, for a high-level government official in an official memo, to call out and, and to basically direct, uh, at least that's how it was interpreted, uh, you know, companies to not use a commercial enterprise sent absolute shockwaves all over the globe, not just in the US. I've had people from, from, uh, that are working with governments all over the planet. I, had, I even had commercial companies. I had, a, I had a SPCs working with a commercial company in China who heard about this, this memo, their, their customer heard about this memo and wanted to find out what the heck is going on. You know, why is the US government not using SAFE when you know, we're in the middle of our SAFE adoption? So it was, it was a pretty dramatic event. So we had to figure out how to respond to it. We couldn't ignore it, it wasn't gonna go away. It was too high level. You know, it's not like your typical you know, you know, bloggers who nobody knows and they just have an ax to grind. They're ill-informed and they just do what they do. And our historical pattern has been, we just, we just don't feed that fire. We, we ignore it and let the market sort it out. But we couldn't do that, not, not with this one, because it was a real threat, real threat to our business, and we certainly didn't, weren't gonna take it sitting down. Now, we, we could have responded in a very aggressive, you know, flame back, uh, you know, kind of thing. We could have taken legal action. We could have done all kinds of stuff. Instead, what we decided to do is, is try to live the very agile values and, and safe values that we teach. And so we reached out directly to this, this individual, Nick Chalane, and asked for a, a conversation. You know, hey, we've seen this, it's causing, causing some churn, I'd like to talk to you about it. It started off with a conversation between Nick and our CEO, Chris James, and it was a and it was at least a positive it wasn't uh, you know wasn't uh, didn't get a retraction or anything like that but but you know we didn't get hung up on either so we called that a win and chris was able to at least open the dialogue and get agreement for us to continue that dialogue which we did and so earlier this year i think it was in february ish time frame uh, it's hard to remember anything that's happened before covid but 
uh, so a contingent of us it was myself, Chris, uh, our our key thought leader in our company on DevOps, uh, and, and and then some other folks on the phone, including Dean, had this meeting with Nick and and his team to talk about this further. Now understand just where Nick is coming from. Nick Nick's background and his history is very much in that. And, and what I've seen very common in the DevOps community, very startup driven, very narrowly focused on, on cloud-based software development and very modern uh, technical stacks in the development pipeline. So he's very into the tool stacks when the, and, you know, Docker and Kubernetes and Jenkins and, you know, this, this whole set of things. It's really, his, that's really his jazz, right? Um, and, and so, so that's, that's where he's coming from. That's his way of working. And he was hired to bring that way of working into the government. That's how he got the job. And unfortunately, he, as he went out to, to visit some programs, he did visit an Air Force program that was re reported to be following safe. They were following safe. They had SPCs on site. You know, they were trying, saying they were using safe. Unfortunately, this is one of those those instances, and we know they're out there, where people say they're following SAFE. They may have sent people to training. They may even have SAFE coaches on site, uh, but they're certainly not doing the practices as we've recommended in the framework. They've had their own interpretation. And, and in our conversation, as Nick shared some of the things that he was seeing and some of the answers he was being given by coaches on site about SAFE, which were totally wrong and totally off, but that was all he had to go off of. And so he got this impression of what SAFE was that was probably 90% just totally wrong. And frankly, if we didn't know SAFE and had been told this is what SAFE was, we would have had the same reaction. So would you, uh, be because it just, it wasn't what we teach. But yet this is what he thought SAFE was with nothing to go off than these conversations. So that was super helpful. And as you know, as we're sitting in, the, in his office in the Pentagon, and we're, we're kind of uncovering this stuff. I'm just sitting here thinking, well, no wonder, no, no wonder, right? Which really emphasizes why individuals and interactions right off of the Agile Manifesto is so important, right? That we would never have learned that if we had taken a combative approach. Instead, we took a collaborative approach. Help us understand where you're coming from. Uh, and through that, we learned a lot. Right? We, we learned and, and, and actually tried to uh, maybe change some of those impressions and point out where that just wasn't accurate. And, and you know, he and, and Dean had a lot of that conversation. And I think we, we were successful. Bottom line is we were successful coming out of that with an agreement to continue to cooperate and collaborate. Because there were some areas where his, his observations were actually accurate. And, and that is in, their, in, in the fact that in SAFE, and if you guys know SAFE at all, you know this, in our DevOps conversation, we, go, we don't go down to tech stacks and things like that because Scaled Agile is used in so many diverse environments and architectures and, and, and markets. And, and you know, if we just wrote about, we've always felt like we just wrote about one tool or one stack or, it's going to be so limiting. People will think that safe only applies there th that we've excluded everything else. And so we've tried to stay up above that thinking that the, that, that our partners and other parts of the market would come in and fill in those, those details when they were serving in those markets where those were needed. And, and we've kind of evolved that thinking now. And, and one of the agreements that we came out of that conversation with Nick, is that where he's going we're going to work together he's going to help us craft new guidance that will become part of the framework uh, we we are some of our thought leaders are attending his platform one training to get better understanding from his perspective of, of what he views as important and how it, how it's being taught and trained in the air force uh, and we may even even bring some new products online so let's talk about that so let me just go ahead and build these out. This is what it looks like. So by the way, that, that meeting led to a joint public announcement. If you haven't seen that 
And if you're one of those people who are working in an agency where this whole situation caused real problems uh, and you didn't catch this, do know that there was a joint statement from our company and from Nick's office that publicly established that we were working together as I have just described. And you see a screenshot from, from one of the, the government um, uh, news, news wires. So if you're dealing with that, make sure you've got your hand on that, on that joint announcement and, and that you can use that if you've got customers who are, you're, who are asking you questions about it. So what we're going to do in the short term is we're going to develop an advanced topic article because we can do that easily. We can just write it. We can add it. We can do that quickly. It's being developed right now that will go into this depth on DevSecOps and more technical guidance. Uh, in the future, we're looking at adding to the big picture behind our DevOps iconography a, a entirely new landing page, not just an article, but much like the government icon has, where you've got multiple articles, you've got all kinds of resources that do go into that technical depth on modern software development technologies and practices that will be behind that icon on the big picture. So that would be after and beyond the advanced topic article. Uh, we're also looking at developing a, a, an entirely new course around DevSecOps that would teach. So technical training, unlike anything we've ever done at Scaled Agile before. We think this is growing, this is large enough, this is the way the world develops software and software is eating the world. And so it's not just going to be the Air Force that cares about these conversations around tech stacks and technical practices. So we're, we're in the process of evaluating and looking ways to rapidly bring to market that kind of training. And then we also are going to promote our, our thought leadership that I mentioned earlier on industrial DevOps and really try to, to make it clear to the community, look, we've, we, have, we have been fully on board with DevOps for a long time, even though the market's not in that community may not be giving us credit for it. And the great example of that is working as part of Gene Kim. If you know Gene, the author of the Phoenix Project uh, and his, his DevOps conferences, uh, I've actually been friends with Gene for years. I've been to his conferences since the very first one. I've spoken at his conferences almost every year. Uh, and, and, I'm, and I and Dean are, and, and Harry are part of the, the, the DevOps leadership forum that he holds every year to work on these white papers. So if you go to IT Revolutions and you see the industrial DevOps white papers there, go look at the authors and see who contributed to those. And you'll see myself and you'll see Dean and you'll see Harry. Uh, on, on this whole thing about industrial DevOps. So we're gonna make more hay on that. Let people know, yeah, we really are advancing the, the knowledge base here as well in these large complex environments. So there that is. Any, Mark, do we have any questions just on that? It may not apply to everybody, but I know anyone who's been affected by this, it's an incredibly sore spot. And I wanna make sure that everyone's aware of what we're doing about it. Thanks for bringing that, Dr. Steve. If any question around the table? All right, I'm not hearing any, so we'll, we'll give it a little more time for the NQA. Just a couple other things and, I'm, and then I'm done, and it's, and it's total questions. I'll make sure everybody understands how we're supporting government. So as I mentioned, we have an entire series of articles around how to adopt SAFE in a government agency if you go to the government icon on the big picture, it's gonna take you to this page here. I had to break it in two pieces because it's a long page. So kind of in the middle there where you see safer government, you see a little bit of an article and there's a hyperlink. It'll actually take you to an entire series of articles that covers contracting and governance and compliance and strategy and all these funding and budgets, all these things about, about operating safe in a government environment that are, are, are you know, very deep and, and, and it's freely accessible to anyone. On that same page, you'll see we, we have a lot of resources that are not authored by Skilled Agile, but they're certainly helpful to anybody that's working in the government space trying to do an Agile transformation. 
And so that, those are the that bottom, uh, that, that far right area is the bottom of that page, and that's where you'll find those resources. I will say they may be a, a little bit out of date because like everybody else, the whole COVID thing caught us blindside. We've had to spend the last two solid plus months completely pivoting our business model and responding to this crisis. Uh, and, and so, you know, we've got folks that have been diverted and not paying as much attention. So if you know, just give us a little grace, if you don't mind, if you go there and you find some things that may, a link that may not work or something that may be out of date, we will get back to that and refresh it uh, as we come out of this crisis. Um, but it's a great resource and, and anything that we learn about that's helpful to people in the government space, we'll add it to this landing page. Last thing is we actually have a course. So I, I was the product owner and author behind Safe for Government. Uh, it is a tipping course. The, the main message out of Safe for Government is the biggest issue in a government program is just getting everybody to understand and agree that SAFE can actually work in their program. And that is the goal of the Safe for Government course. We will show how the SAFE work, how can it work with the issues that, that most government agencies have to deal with. If, if you have people go to that class and you're successful in getting them to see that it actually does work with the guidance we provide, with the case studies we provide, and they, they agree to move forward with SAFE from that point on, don't keep teaching SAFE for government because the job has been done. All SAFE for government is doing is making it clear this can work. Once they're convinced it can work, use all the other guidance and courseware in the framework and in all the courses, leading SAFE, implementing SAFE, LPM, APM, those work just as well in the government environment as they do in any other environment, and we have proven that over and over and over again. The problem is that those techniques don't work in government. The problem was getting government people to believe they could actually work and be open to that conversation. And Safer Government will, will help break that, break that barrier. And these are the topics in Safer Government that specifically are designed for the government context that we, we spend basically half the course walking through each of these things that you see here. Final thought from Uncle Deming. Biggest thing we see in government spaces is that, you know, whether it's agile, lean, safe, just won't work. Our problems are different. We're unique, won't work in government. Deming told us decades ago that a common disease that afflicts management and government Government administrations the world over is the impression that our problems are different. They are different to be sure, but the principles that will help improve quality of the product and service are, a uni are universal in nature. So Deming was a pretty smart cookie. He saw this decades ago, uh, and I think he gives us very wise advice for how to serve our government customers in, in adopting SAFE. And with that, that's all I have to present. I'm more than happy to answer any questions uh, that you might have. Thanks a lot, Dr. Steve. That was really interesting. And I think uh, Mark asked a question. Sure. And as I teach Safe for Government, uh, I think uh, I work on, he's asking in Safe for Government course if it was to be teach reflecting the Canadian context. Um, would That's it great. need a partner to update or uh, need to um, uh, interesting collaboration? And I think if I may just input, I have some updates to that because I teach that course. Mm -hmm. And I think I would have a question about the course after, you, after I hear your answer. Sure, absolutely. So uh, when we first, when we did the first MVP, the first version of the course, it was clearly a U.S. context because that it was our first attempt at a, at a government course. Government still remains our only vertical market that we're explicitly serving. And so we, we had no idea how it was going to go. And, and it took off very quickly. And almost immediately, we were inundated with questions from people working with governments outside the U.S., how can we make this work for us? Because there were a lot of US specific references in the course. So last year, uh, I did a major revision to the course to accommodate 
the fact that it's being taught in places outside the US. So without getting into too much gory detail, basically if you're an SPC and you're going to teach, say for government, through the enablement, if you watch the enablement videos and look at the trainer guides, you will see that we provide two paths. One path is a set of uh, all the slides, the student guide, everything, that is US specific because it's still the most, the largest market that is, is using it. If you're in a non US environment, we provided a, excuse me, a second option. This option actually allows the instructor, first time in the history of Skilled Agile, where we have, we have created a mechanism by which an instructor can provide contextualized content into one of our courses. Now it's, it's, it's very, it's very narrowly defined, so you can't go in and change our slides. You can't change the course because remember, this is this is a scaled agile course. It has a certification, and so you know it just doesn't. We wouldn't be able to have you do anything you want to the course, and still be able to do a cert and an exam around it. But there is a, there is enough latitude provided in in two specific lessons that we, we give you, say, in these spots, you can create your own content, your Canadian content, and you can insert it right here in this lesson and in this lesson. Because there is no way that, that we can understand how these things work in every government on the planet. We just can't. So that is on the SPC delivering the class to develop and, and present that content. By the way, the content that the, the SPC develops and presents obviously is not testable. So that you, no student will have to worry about, you know, it, 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 that content that that instructor developed. Are they going to have to, are they going to see an, a, a question on the exam uh, about, about that custom content? So it's not testable, but it, we allow instructors to include it because it's the only way to make the course relevant in every unique country's context. So that's the strategy that we took for that. So far, so good. Most folks seem to have figured out how to, how to do that and how to manage that. Um, so I hope that answered the question, but Mark, if you had, if you had a follow-up to that, I'd be happy to answer it. Well, I, uh, yeah, Steve, um, I, I, just, just, just to qualify the question, I was just trying to figure out, is that uh, strictly a client partner driven initiative or would SAI be interesting, interested in collaborating and contributing to that effort? Because so if, if, if we start delivering the course in Canada, it's kind of a win-win for, for all of us. Yeah, so he, here's the deal. You know, there, there are what, 189 countries on the planet. There is no way scaled agile. We had these debates, we long, hard, vigorous, animated debates on the role that scaled agile could play in, in validating, managing, curating, distributing any of these country specific things. And we just landed at a place we, we just can't scale to that. And, and, and so what we did is, is we created a common core product that allows for that, that very specific customization. And, and then we leave it in the hands of the SPC. Any, any SPC that goes through the enablement for Safe for Government has the guidance and the, and the instructions on how they are permitted by the license to, to build and deliver that custom content. And we're, we're just not going to get in, in the middle of that process. We, we don't have the manpower to do that. Okay, so, thanks, for, thanks for confirming. Yeah, we would say to you, if you want to get together with a, a group, so let's say that a group of partners or individuals got together and collaborated on, on how to deliver that in Canada and, and with, you know, with some, you know, gravitas behind it that would kind of make it the, you know, the, the version of choice in your market, that'd be awesome. I know, I know people in other countries have done that. They've got, they've, they've joined forces developed that that country specific content and then they all deliver it so something to think about so mark i um thank you dr steve actually i started doing that and we can connect together and actually um work on that more and more dr steve on speaking uh, i have two questions sure. if you allow me 
Yeah, first thing, um, I think any SPC, any transformation coach had experienced the transformation stages or how those approached in, in enterprise. Right. Can, from experience, can you give us just a glimpse about how, um, is it the same in government? Is it slightly different where we start, where we end, kind of stages of adoption that go through uh, from, for example, essential safe to portfolio to large solution kind of. And my yeah. second question, um, uh, safer government is really interesting uh, uh, course. Um, but it's really harder than leading safe. If you compare it to leading safe, it has much, much more, almost from exercises, from content. So any quick advices on running that smoothly within the two days frame that we, we are obliged to deliver? Yep, sure. Let me, let me deal with those two questions in that order. So transformations to safe inside of a government context, I mean, there are, there are some similarities. Here's the biggest thing. I'll give you a couple of big, huge differences. Number one is in, in the commercial space, transformations usually start one of two ways. Within a part of the organization, let's say in, in the IT department, so underneath the CIO's purview, right? Somehow this, this transformation to SAFE begins. Uh, maybe it's in, in one part of the, the org chart and then it expands, expands, expands. Or it could be top down, right? CIO comes and says, we're going to do this. In the government, you know, government agencies are, it's particularly when it comes to the technology, it's all built around programs, right? And it has to do with how things are funded uh, in, in a government in, environment. Uh, it has to do with the, the whole contracting acquisition model because most government agencies in any country don't have the manpower to do uh, do a program just with their government employees. So they have to bring people from industry. They have to do contracting. So this very program-centric, contracting-centric uh, way that work gets done in a government agency just tends to look different. So you can literally be in the very same agency and this program that's building this backend system and literally right in that, in that same area and under the same technical org chart, somebody else is running a different program that has its, you know, its own funding and is led by a different uh, program manager is completely different. Right, and it, it, one, one could be agile, one could be waterfall, one, one could be using safe, one could be using, you know, less, could be what, whatever. And so it's, it's much more um, just kind of a, a, a mishmash that, that government agencies don't, in my experience, don't do when it comes to this kind of stuff. They don't do a lot of enterprise thinking, right? Let's have an enterprise, an agency wide model for for how we do safe so in the commercial space i have seen full company enterprise wide no kidding no exceptions we're doing safe no other options period full stop into discussion i haven't seen that anywhere in a government agency even in some of our best example customers it's not because the entire agency went safe it's because a leader of a program or maybe a, a branch or part of that agency uh, decided to implement SAFE, uh, but it's just, li just as likely that some other uh, parallel program is doing something completely different. There seems to be a real aversion to doing a full agency-wide uh, model, and it has to do with fair competition and all different kinds of things that a lot of uh, private companies don't have to deal with. So that's the biggest thing. Down at the ground level, when you're dealing with the engineers, software developers, uh, hardware engineers, testers, QA people, UX people, forming agile teams, building backlogs, user stories, conducting PI plannings, at that level, there's no difference. It's, it, it's all the same. There may be far further behind uh, in technology than their commercial counterparts, 
uh, but they're, they're people just like the people that get hired in, in commercial agencies. They have the same you know, desires to grow. They have the, the same technologies that they're using. So yeah, it really ha tends to be at the higher level, more at what you consider the portfolio uh, level in SAFE, where the differences are, are, are pretty dramatic. And by the way, that's why you'll notice that a lot of the concepts that are in day two of safer government are really concepts that come from the portfolio level of safe. And on your second question, uh, so yes, even though it looks a lot like leading safe, uh, it, it absolutely is not. Uh, it, it, it serves a very unique mission. The target audience, for safer government is very different. And I find a lot of SPCs don't get this. So let me, let me state it here very clearly. Safer government was intended to be delivered for, for leaders, influencers, and decision makers inside an agency who have the ability to, to guide or make the decision that that agency or program will go safe. That's the target, not the developers, not not all the other people, right? Safer government's not going to be for them. So we, and, and in safer government, we deal with some really tough questions, as you know, around budgeting and about, and, and around strategy and, and around governance and about contracting. Those aren't, those aren't concerns for the teams. Those are concerns for, for fairly senior people in the government agency. They're heady problems and, and they require tough conversations. And so we didn't pull any punches on, on, on that course. Um, how to get to the con through the content. I've delivered it many times. I've always made it through the content. I know if you're dealing in, in, a, in an environment where it's a non-native English speaking environment, that's going to be tough. And so, you know, what you have to do is you, as you do in any safe course, you have to, you have to, as an instructor, you have to understand your audience. You have to listen and, and be sensitive to where their questions are, kind of how things are gone, what the greatest areas of interest uh, are. Is your, is your class even, even concerned with certification? We provide a certification because we do that for all of our courses. How many people that take safer government, if they're that government program manager, um, actually sit for the exam? Probably less than most of our courses because that's not really why they took it. Um, some of them do take it because in, in the government environment, even more so than many commercial environments, certifications are kind of a big deal. So that's why we had to, and, and we asked, we, we beta, Alpha and Beta tested this in this market extensively, and we asked for those kinds of pieces of feedback, and, and, and that's why we stuck with, with providing the certification. But, but yeah, it, it, you, you've, this is, this is why, you, you know, if you've watched, hopefully you've watched the enablement, I made it clear in the, in the very first enablement video, look, if, you know, you, this is really intended for people who have mastery of the government environment. And you have that ability to listen and watch and observe what your particular class is interested in, what their, what their hot buttons are. And maybe you spend, choose to spend more time in that topic area and, and not as much time in another topic area. You point it out, you go through it quickly, make sure they know how to find it, if they're gonna sit for the exam uh, and how to do deeper reading, but you just don't spend the time there. And you spend more time in the area that they, they are deeply you know, concerned or confused or interested in. And that's, you know, that's, how, that's how you get through. You know what your time box is. Uh, if you're doing an internal one, not a public one, you can always, uh, you know, have an have an extended conver, an extended day. Uh, you know, that's a common pattern we see for not just this course but other courses, where okay, we just did the two-day class. Now let's have a third day and let's really reason through what this means for our organization. You can certainly do that as well. Other questions. Any other question for Dr. Steve? So let me just say, if, as we're waiting for any last minute questions to come through, 
Uh, I, I am absolutely uh, open and, and available and will respond to anything that comes to mind after tonight. My contact info, email is best, but I, I put my, my Twitter and LinkedIn information out there as well. Um, email is probably fastest. Uh, absolutely feel free to follow up, send a question. If you're, if you're trying to get ready to deliver this class and, and you're kind of confused about something, um, you know, shoot it to me, I'll be happy to answer it. <coughs> um, one last thing is, is for those that may not be aware in this audience, even though we're in the land of COVID, we've, we're not canceling the summit that's coming up in a couple of weeks. We've gone totally virtual. We are using a you know, pretty darn sophisticated system that's designed to do this and platform it so that it's a virtual co conference type experience. Uh, it, it is going to be on the Central European time zone, so that may be a detractor. Uh, I, I know I'm, you know, kind of, yeah, you know, going to really have to work hard to figure out how to, you know, get up at, at midnight and deliver uh, classes and things at 2 a.m. in the morning uh, on my time. But uh, it, it is, a, it's a great opportunity, more cost effective for sure, in that you don't have to travel to it. And so I just will make sure that that's out there. Uh, and there's a lot of, of great topics that will be covered. And so. Uh, if, if that's something of interest, just two days, no travel required, uh, economically, cost-wise, the cost of the virtual version is is less. So just want to make sure everybody was aware of that opportunity. Dr. Maynard, I have one question. Yeah, please. I don't know if you remember me. My name is Shabir. It's good to, good to finally see you in the remote environment. You gave me my SPC two years ago. So yes. my question is that... Um, I know you teach a lot of remote courses and I was talking to Rich the other day and he said that there might be places where I can come in and observe. Uh -huh. Is there a possibility that I can observe some course that you're doing over the next month or so? Because I'll be at the Safe Summit, but then is it a possibility that you allow current SPCs to come observe your courses in virtual settings? So uh, l let's, let's definitely talk more offline. Just shoot me a note to my email address uh, and... Let, let's let's explore what we can do there. I will tell you that, and 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 I do often run into folks that when I was part of our advisory team when I first came to the company, I was doing heavy heavy delivery of classes all over the world, mm -hmm. uh, and 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 if I were still in that mode, uh, you know that that would be a really easy request to to address because I was delivering almost every week. Uh, so over the last year, year and a half, since moving over into the framework team, uh, working with Dean and, and Harry and Luke and Inbar, uh, uh, you know, doing the, the writing of the articles and the building of the courses, uh, I, I actually have, I don't have any deliveries on my calendar right now. Uh, oh. I, don't, I just don't do that in the same way that I used to. Uh, now, that means I don't. I, I don't do it at all. In fact, I had one customer that specifically asked me to do an implementing for them in the month of May, but with all the COVID stuff going on, they just they just had funding issues. Uh, so I had that had to be uh, delayed. So I do do some. They're just not many as they used to be. And right now, again, mostly because of, of, of you know COVID and other things, I just don't have any on my calendar. But there may be other ways for us to satisfy what, what you're looking for. So let's let's not you know let's not shut off those possibilities. Reach out to me. Let's talk about it offline. And let's see what we can do. I will. Thank you. It's good to see you. Oh, great! Great. great. Good, to, good to make connections again. Any other question? So I would thank you, Dr. C, for your time. Uh, Rob, thank you for being here. If you want to have a word before closing, just before we closing, uh, please stay tuned to our Facebook page, to our um, LinkedIn group. We actually planning more and more exciting uh, speech every week, every month. We have uh, all classes available. Um, connect with us, stay tuned. Thanks a lot, Dr. Steve. Rob, over to you. Thanks. I'm good. Thanks a lot, Mark, for hosting us. Thank you, Steve, for the great presentation.
Anytime. Happy to do it. Okay. Without further ado, I think we are 10 minutes over. Thanks a lot. It's a very interesting topic, Dr. Steve. I appreciate your time and quick response. And thanks for everyone. I will share with you um, the presentation. I will share with you after Dr. Steve's permission. And I will share the recording with everyone. Thanks a lot. Have a good night. Enjoy your next weekend.